So, folks, listen, I, I need to, I want to talk to you about what, uh, what's being proposed. So, we have a, a big issue that's right, and it needs to be discussed by this group. So, I'm recommending that we sort of abandon the agenda. We'll, we'll come right back to that. And this really fits into it anyway very well. But it's a specific issue. So, we want to discuss this issue. And the issue is about closing the bay. And under what conditions would be appropriate for reopening it. So, that's... Does anybody have an issue with having that as our, our discussion point until we conclude that even if it takes all day, that's fine. Whatever it takes to get to some to see where we are, if we take it up further, we will. Is that okay with everybody? Does anybody have a problem with that? So just give me some positive affirmation. Uh, take that as a yes. Okay, I'm going to first turn it over to Jim Estes from FWC. Jim? Okay, I'm going to be kind of careful here. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to get in front of uh, our political leadership. I sort of want to get in front of our administrative leadership. But we have going through this process that was just described a few minutes ago, and I believe in the process as you described it. But we have our own. FBC has our own process and timelines for different things that are not quite matching. And probably I would need to have some input probably from Ed when we talk about this. So let me introduce this by saying it is, believe it or not, it is easy for us to close things, but it's more complicated than you can do. Oh, no. Jeez. My wife would never say that. Um, it needs to be recorded. That's so, is that better? So, it's, it's easy for us to close things, but it's more complicated to open things up. So we can see a problem occurring, and we can close things, and we have done that. You've seen it with the federal fisheries and with the state we can close things. Um, but so, because of this problem, I think that it would be somewhat irresponsible of us to do an oyster closure without telling people what conditions that it would take for us to open things up. And so, in my very simple mind, um, and this is somewhat inappropriate, I think the way I was thinking about it, is that we have these um, metrics in the past, I think we even have them, some of them in rule, that says under certain conditions that we're going to slow fishing down, and under these conditions we'll speed fishing back up. And I think that the number was for a healthy, uh, commercially harvestable uh, oyster population that we have to have 400 bags to the acre as the density. And doesn't measure doesn't, before we would change things. In other words, open things back up. So that's a good population metric. Um, but we're going through this process and with our NIFWIP project, we're going to have uh, Dr. Kim and, and the folks here help us go through how we're going to manage things differently. So we're, so we're not going to have the oyster harvest is not going to be managed the same way in the future that it has been, which is pretty much been open, y'all come get them, and we'll close things once in a while because of um, food safety issues. So I would like to be able to tell my administration and possibly my commissioners under what conditions that we could open it. And I originally thought it's 400 bags to the acre, and there's some unknown amount of acreage that we would open it then. But we also know we're going to manage it differently. So I'm stuck in between, in between what I think that we're going to do and what we're actually going to end up doing. So if we have, let me give you an example. So what if we do some restoration and we find out that after three or four years that we have 400 bags of the acre on that point. <clears throat> well, I don't want to open that up like it has been. And so then we're going to have to figure out how we can open it up to a few people. But if we have cap point and if everything is perfect, which is probably not be. we got dry bars, so those are large areas. Or if we have some small summer bar areas that we could open. So am I, making, am I getting, getting clear so I'm stuck? And trying to figure out and to advise my administration and my commission 
wonder what those conditions are. And I think here's where I probably can use Ed's help because he's going to be doing this adaptive management thing while we're doing this. So again, the timing is just not right. But I know that several of you are impatient, Steve, mm -hmm. for us to do something about this. But we got to do it in the right way. And we've been talking about this for a long time, and we haven't done it yet. But I think that we're on the precipice of being ready to do it. So I'd like to hear a discussion about what you all think would be the conditions by which we would open things back up. That's what we'd like to hear from the discussion. Even if we don't end up with a consensus, at least you can give me some ideas that I can think about because I'm going to be responsible for it. Okay, so one of the things that we talked about with, with Ed and, and with Jim, with our team, was when they received this new funding project, is that we would try to you know, put our projects together and use our stakeholder group as part of the process. So this is really a perfect timing in some ways because this was going to be on discussion today anyway uh, as one of the possible strategies, but we'll make that this a discrete topic. So there's really two questions. I know maybe from Jim's point of mind there's not, there isn't, but for this group, one is, should the baby close? And under what conditions should it be reopened? And Jim's most interested in that second, but we, we should discuss these two points generally. First, do you agree that, that based on what we know, and we saw a lot of interesting data today, it was pretty clear, no matter what point of view you have, that the, that the bay has collapsed. I mean, seriously. There's so many questions that. And so, you know, what do we do? So if we agree first that it should be closed, what conditions would it require to be reopened? Just a picky terminology issue. We're not talking about closing the bay. I know this is a colloquialism, you know, it's that we're talking about closing the oyster fishery. And I think it would be good to get us the habit of saying that just to avoid any misunderstanding in the future. Thank you. That is an excellent point. Thank you for making that. Because you, you mentioned that before and it's completely correct. Thank you. It's easy to slip back into it. Yeah, it's just such a long thing. People were talking about closing the bay forever. So we're, we're talking about closing the commercial oyster harvest fishery. Jim? Um, I would say that the question is should we, clo should we close harvesting to both commercial and recreation? Yeah. I think that's, that's true. That's, that's true. true. Good man. Okay. So that's sort of the layout. Um, I'm going to open the discussion. So, you know, should the baby should commercial and recreational oyster harvesting be closed in the Apalachicola Bay system? A. B. Under what conditions should it be reopened? Who wants to start the conversation? Tom. And then Shannon. Oh, so we want to stand back here. Jim, I'm just thinking about. It. The issue here. So, at some point, if you reopen the bay to oyster harvest, right, it's gonna there's some type of a limited entry situation. And so, what would be the process in your mind to identify who the eligible participants in the fishery might be? How do you identify that population? That, that's the first time. So, I don't have any idea until we engage and we get into the bigger engagement with what um, Dr. Camp is doing, so I really can't answer how we would identify who would be the recipients of the ability to, to harvest. I have some ideas, but I don't want to get in front of that. I'd like to respond to that, too, unless you have something else. This process, when you, you want to go on first? Or? Just real quick. I mean, why, I think that why that's important, because it, it sets the amount of pressure that you're going to put on the resource, and that affects what conditions allow you to open it up. Right. So in this process, <clears throat> the contemplation was that we would go through all the various things, including the limited entry as, a, as an option and discuss the pros and cons of the future thing. We're not there yet. But what we can do is talk about under what conditions it might be open. It may be that one of the conditions is some, that some sort of limited entry fishery would be implemented. Maybe not. There's a lot of different things that we can discuss. That would at least give Jim some suggestions for the type of things that should be considered. We're going to discuss these things over time using, using our science and our modeling tools to evaluate and guess our performance measures whether these strategies actually work. But for now, because it's a timely issue uh, and it's something that's going to be happening soon, we can, the best we can do is provide some guidance. So, did I speak to you as the second person? Okay, okay Shannon, go ahead. Then 
Jim, you know that we developed a smart group, a secret management assistance resource recovery for that particular reason to discuss that. And we had many discussions in those meetings, just us, about that. And the biggest, that was the biggest fear that we closed what would open it back up and what would be, <clears throat> what kind of harvest we would be able to harvest. Um, but with that, so, uh, with the sentences we kept on talking about was, you know, there's a lot of the Bay Area, there's a lot of beds, you know, and a lot of the beds are never really productive very often, you know. So you would, we would talk about pinpointing areas that's most productive over the last 30 years on a consistent time of the years and use those bars for the actual percentage of what would be considered healthy. And, the, you know, in, in, in the 400 bag was a 300 bag, 400 bag, you know, back and forth there. But the, the most important thing was when it reopened, who would you have harvest in Orson And most of the guys, like, if we go back pre, before the oil spill, because those numbers got ridiculous on the or the harvesters. If you went back pre oil spill, pre oil spill, and just focus like from 20 to 2010, you could look at the consistent, because you got the data, got the harvesters, how many bushes of oil they call, how often they oil spill. Showed they actually made their living oysters. The number still would be kind of big, but then you could go to that same list because it's on on file. How many's had undersized tickets? How many's been closed orders? How many's had you know those kind of tickets? Not life jacket or a fraction of your number or after the harvested the oysters prices. And you pull those guys out of the place. You know, so then you brought these numbers down even smaller. And then the only thing to do there would be sort of like a lottery, you know, because you still would be looking at probably a good 350 oystermen. But then that's not saying I'm how many oystermen that would, you would be looking at, you know, to be harvested oysters. You know, we, those numbers we talked about before, 100, we talked about uh, 200, you know. So those numbers you gotta, we got to figure out as well how many actual is going to be able to be harvesters. Um, but there's been a lot of discussion with my group, and I'd love to sit down with my group with this, you know, and and because these guys have been doing it all their lives, you know, and they know they've seen it, they know what in the past what's happened. Um, Jim, can you speak to the perspective you have from the, the water that you're talking about, but you're thinking about this issue in terms of closure? Most all of them, the percentage is going way up. I said at least 98% of the ultimate now want to see a bay, the bay close. But the biggest issue with most of them want to see the bay close is how it be reopened. What be, you know, if it's closed, it never re be reopened. And that's been the biggest fear of all. But I don't feel like it would be that way because I feel like we could set something forth. And, and well, I don't know if it's going to be two years. I don't know if it's going to be five years. You know, that, those numbers, I don't know what those numbers are going to be, but until we close the bay, we can start getting accurate data, we are not going to know these numbers. You know, we're going to keep on fighting the same battle, because every time they bring, I mean, I, I work on the F, 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 FWC at UF project for four years, and every time we start to get some decent data, the guys would come in there and wipe it out, so we didn't get accurate data. You know, so we don't know what would have, you know, because we didn't have it to see. You know, that's the issue we're having. But also that said, when you start looking at bags per acre, you got to look at the, instead of, you know, I know that every pinpoints, that particular pinpoint every time, but you're going to have to have more pinpoints. Say with Cat Point, you know, such a big bar, you're going to have to have four pinpoints to get an accurate data on how many bushels per acre it's on. You know, every bar is different in size. You know, some are smaller, some are bigger. You know, so that's got to be looked at as well. You know, where you get accurate acreage. 
know, uh, I know with, with, like, with, with the Dax, and I think a lot of them can point off of the Dax areas, they go to the exact same place on Cat Point and been doing that for 20 something years. And there's a lot of oysters purposely will go over there and catch the oysters over there just so they would have nothing to go by. You know, I mean, it was a joke, you know, among the oysters. You know, that's just the way it was. And, and when I tried to keep them off the, 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 the other sites that was closed for harvest, the study sites, there was guys that were just, they don't, just meant they were going to go and, and, and harvest those oysters. They care, you know, and that's the biggest issue I think we're having on our recovery side. Well, first point I think there's no question the bay needs to be closed. I mean, if, if we're wasting our time if we don't close the bay. The, I agree that opening, when do you open? Uh, I mean, in the old days, 200 bags per acre was considered, but oystermen won't even go out to those areas because it's not worth the time. Well, that's been proven wrong since the crash. So, so you know, as we start talking about when we would reopen the bay, we, we need to be pretty specific, I think, with regard to the number of acres of oyster bars that has a certain density, whether it's 400 bags per acre or whatever. If you have one area, one small area that's got 400 bags per acre and you open that up, they're going to be gone. So we haven't accomplished anything. So there has to be, you know, and we're looking at in the past somewhere between six and 8,000 acres of oyster bars, public oyster bars. The other thing is we need to, we need to be real specific we're, we're actually not closing the bay for oyster harvesting. We're closing the bay for wild harvest. There's still going to be aquaculture going on in the bay. So, so we have to be specific. It's wild harvest that we're, we're, we would be closing the bay. But I think we need to come up, and I don't know what the answer is, to a certain density of, of oysters on bars and a certain area that 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 you may have to cover. Maybe it's a thousand acres, maybe it's two thousand acres. It'd be best to have it split around the bay, you know, because back in 2007, when we had the drought, Cat Point didn't produce much, but Dry Bar produced a lot. So the amount of harvest didn't go down significantly. And, and my, my boss at the EP at the time said, okay, you've got this drought, and how come the oyster harvest numbers didn't go down? I said, because it was enough of Dry Bar to carry us through, they harvested about the same amount. There just wasn't anything at Cap Point. Cap Point eventually came back. So we need to, and, and, and again, I don't know the answer, but there needs to be a limit on the number of people that can harvest. There needs to be a certain density of oysters on a certain number of acres, a certain percentage of acres, before we can <coughs> consider reopening the bay. Because if we, if we get some oysters coming back, in a couple locations and it's not very big. It'll be like the summer bars all over again. You get two weeks after you open the summer bars, they're all gone. You know. And the, all the all the large ones are gone. Then they start taking the smaller ones. And and then you you've lost those fat producers. So I mean we gotta take all this into account. But the other thing is once you look at reopening the bay, you've got to have enforcement out there. If you don't have enforcement, you're wasting your time. And we also need to consider something that's been talked about for years is if you got poachers and you got people bringing in undersized oysters, et cetera, et cetera, once they get arrested once or twice, they lose their license. They can't go back out in the bay and make, make a living anymore. Um, that's been part of the problem in the last five or six years. We got too many outlaws out here, quite frankly. Anyway. So, I didn't give you any answers, but it, <laughs> it, those are the kinds of things we need to talk about. Yeah, those are all really good. Uh, um, the, uh, the question about closing bay is pretty much another brand. Anybody that, anybody that, that you know, I've heard things like, well, there, there are so few wishes to take and so few wishes out of the bay now, it doesn't really matter. It, it does matter, you know, because 
because if any oysters do come back in the bay, the bay is open, they let like everybody stay and they go catch the oysters right away. They're taking not only oysters, but shell material out of the bay. But nothing needs to be taken out of the bay. I mean, we, we saw the, the numbers. There's virtually no oysters out there. And I couldn't think of any, any management, any type of fisheries or wildlife management, hunting, anything that it would, any, you know, the ducks or were depleted or deer were depleted down the level of oysters are that there would be any type of or harvest, recreational, commercial, or otherwise. So the way should be closed for oyster harvesting, commercially and recreational, period. Um, for how long? I mean, based on the timelines that you're kind of throwing out here with this project, and restoration, and, and, um, and monies and funding and all that, I mean, you're talking maybe 10 years from now. So open the bay 10 years from now and try to relate it to the people and the individuals that you know, a lot of those people would be 10 years old, they're going to be gone, they're going to be so limited. I mean, obviously the bay would have to be open to a limited harvest and limited entry. And there's a, there's a number of fisheries and instances where limited entry has been, been um, well, conducted in, in different fisheries, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of, a lot of um, precedent on how to go about doing that. but. Um, there's also other management techniques like um, rotational harvest, harvest areas like in Alabama, they do things like that. So there's there's a lot of options out there to um, to manage it once it's open. But um, sure, it's just got to be open based on abundance. And um, I think I think FWC and, and the other agencies can do a good job of counting oysters out there and figure out how many oysters are in the bay and open it based on abundance and, and manage the effort based on the abundance. Okay. Um, Jack, you know, Yeah, um, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Just a couple other points to add. Um, kind of getting back on what Steve said, reopening the bay should be done in stages based on the ocean density. So it's not all on or all off. It should be limited. And then if you're if densities in certain in other additional areas of ours increase, you can add more harvest over time, so it should be done in stages um, based on the science and based on the, the numbers. We also need to factor in not only some bays that are productive that have high density to, to remain there in perpetuity as a spawning reef to contribute to that part of productivity too. We don't get back in the same position we maybe once we open these bars up again. Um, and also, I think a reopening policy should also include. Some shell recycling program, some cover shell, some material, cultural material um, program that's in place um, to make sure we're getting the substrate back into the water. Um, yeah, that was my main point. Thank you. Great, thanks. Sure. So I think we need to answer the first question first. I'm patient to do that. But I think that between what I've heard so far, I do have an idea about how to answer the second question, but I'd like to. Hold that until we answer the first one. All right. So the first question is, do you agree or not that the Appalachian Bay system should be closed for wild oyster harvesting? Yes. 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 Raise your hand. Is there anybody here who does not agree with that? So we have a unanimous agreement from the state on that issue. Sonia. Yeah. Just a point of clarification. You said the Appalachian based system, but it's really, we're just talking about the Apalachicola Bay. Our system includes Alligator Harbor, which currently has a bag okay. at 20. So do we want to include that in this mess, or do we want to just encapsulate Apalachicola Bay? I think we're really talking about, well, I don't know what the topic is. It's been wild card. Yeah, but there's, you can still start this out. Jim, what's, what's your thinking? I think that's a very appropriate question, in fact. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Goldberg is probably going to have to write the definition of what that means, and so I'd like to get some input about what we mean by that, about the bay. So we were, we're talking about that much more bay, which is defining what the, what the closure area is. Uh, yeah. All right, well, that, we'll, we'll so, so we agree that there should be closure, and we'll just, we can discuss what the limits of that closure would be in terms of the perimeter, and then, and then we can now discuss uh, 
what under what conditions should it be? Like? So the main thing I heard is there needs to be a certain amount of density per bar, there needs to be a certain amount of acreage, there needs to be varied locations. There should probably be a limited entry uh, of some sort to get back into the system once it reaches those threshold levels. Maybe some staged openings, uh, shelling, culture, and of course, good enforcement. Those are the things that I heard we discussed potential for any of the show up. Okay, so after listening to after listening to the various options that I heard you all suggest, it seems to me like we are probably actually getting the cart before the horse here, and we're going to be paying Dr. Camp and his um, colleagues a pretty good bit of money to figure this thing out. And he has a good plan to do it very thoughtfully, I think, and so. What I would say is, this is my opinion, but I want to hear. So my concern is that our stakeholders that are outside this meeting, we have folks inside this meeting, I know what you think, and I know that we can find some agreement. But because of what Shannon said, and there's people that are concerned that once we close something, we won't open it, I would like to let the process continue as we planned, contract with you, get our money from NIFWF, work with this group to go do that, because I trust that we will find some happy agreement about how we would do that and we stage it or whatever it is. My question of you all that deal with the public is, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have this question asked me, do we think that the public would be confident in the decisions or suggestions that we make here under this process that appears to be durable based on chest and bait? Do we believe that that's good enough for them? to not define that right now, but to tell them that we're going to work through the process, they will have input in the process to figure out how to do that. In fact, if I'm not just um, jumbling my words up if I'm understandable. I, I totally understand. So I would suggest I would suggest that we wait for the process to unfold. Let the work that we're doing here continue. Let Dr. Camp do his Fancy matching with his economics and sociological and biological modeling. And we don't answer that question right now about how we would do it. So so that's, my, yeah. that's what I believe. But my question to you all is do you think our stakeholders that are outside of this room would trust that to happen? So, so let me lay a few things out in terms of the process of what our plan is here, which is also similar to what we have. What we will be doing is we're right now just discussing some conditions under which that might be considered. We're not saying do this, this, and this. What we learn in Waste and Futures is that it's, it's the combination of, of options that work best. But those options need to be modeled. They have to be ready to model those options and show us how the results of those are. So we're going to be exploring all of these things. We explore the rotation harvest, we explore enforcement, we explore uh, limited entry systems, we restore restoration, shelling, uh, <coughs> shell on staff. Stagging, we, you know, we explore all of those options, and, and the combination of things is what works best. We're not there. We need the science to back that up. We need to evaluate it. We need to build one modeling simulations to show the results. But we can propose these are things that we think are going to be likely and will work. But we're not, we're not, we're not ready to make that recommendation. So that's part of it. The second thing that Jim is saying is, do you think answering as perhaps as vaguely as that, that we are working on each of these, and we will come to a conclusion on them all once we have done the modeling and the science and, and explore this at the stakeholder, will satisfy the public in the short term for an actual closure, as opposed to having laid it all out, which might mean that it would be a year down the road before the bank is <coughs> forward close to wild closing. So the difference is, do we have enough information for the public support, a closure, with the understanding that the conditions for re-entry, here are some of the things that are being considered that have not been decided or finalized yet because we're still evaluating this using the best available science and modeling tools that we have. I wish you had started with that. Yes. Well, we're going to talk. Go ahead. 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 Go ahead.
We're not doing this in a vacuum. I don't know what else Florida can do right now to convey something that would be positive for us given the present state, except it seems like a timely message to send that the bay is being closed by Florida for that reason. Because those folks are this, uh, there's many other reasons to close the bay, but uh, in the next three or four months, Florida and Georgia are going to be looking at what's happening. We're sitting down here with an open bay can't produce oysters. So, I mean, I, we're already buying against that decision by this group. My question was, what's the timeline? <coughs> I guess if your commission can decide at their next meeting. I guess that's a question for Jim. But, I mean, I would it think it would be a wonderful time to do that. Because what else can Florida do in the Supreme Court other than that that might help us? Just to clarify one point, the only thing that we actually raise our hands on is because the, the folks agree that we should close it. We're, we're, on, we're in the discussion phase of the other one. They don't have any agreements in that. Right, I'm sure. Okay. Let you talk. If you're ready to relate to it. So, our commission meets five times a year. Our next meeting is in May. I would like to go talk to them. I've not presented this very far. I'd like to go talk to them about the conditions of that electrical way. Generally, Generally, it takes us two meetings to go do a rule, so we put it in the rule book. And likely, this would be someone like that. And so, I would say, I don't know exactly, but the soonest that I think it could be done would be something like June or July. If that, but I can't commit to doing that because we haven't decided on it. But if the commission voted for that, that would be a special. Okay, um, Georgia. I'll be brief. I just wanted to say. No, you don't have to be. Oh, you don't have to be. Come on. <laughs> um, yes, there's a public support for closure of the bay. We just heard it around this table. I think it's incumbent upon us then to explain clearly why we're in agreement on that. And to Jim's point, we're going to come up with a good, solid, science-based plan for reopening, and that's what we're being charged with to do. So I think the public will get it. The public mostly does get it, but it, again, it'll be coming up on us to make sure our message is clear and can make it happen. And there's different strategies that we can come with that as well. And that's, that's been the biggest thing about Gulf, you know, and they've not always known that 400 bushels is a healthy staining bar, you know, so that, that number is not going to upset them. It's, the, the, it's, it's what percentage of the bay is looked at on what will reopen will be the issue, I think, will be the biggest issue. Um, because we do not know right now what part of the bay is actually going to recover to what it's standard, you know, so that question's in the air. But we see it's still big parts of the bay is a dead area, you know. So, but also I want to bring up something that like Lee said, you know, 2007, we completely wiped out dry bar. Dry bar had never recovered since 2007. It has not had any ocean harvest out of it since 2007. You know? So, yeah, that's it's been an issue. It, it's the way the bay has been operated as well. You know, we will be discussing it. You know, I mean, just like right now we have these high flows. You know, the cat points closed. You know, a big portion of the bay is closed, and used to when it was oyster that forced all the boats to, to two areas, which mostly, mostly. All down to the mile, except for just a handful of boats. And then it's reopened in the same standards, and then it puts all the boats in these one little areas for a period of time. And that's where, you know, we, I, I've always tried to avoid the question of over harvest, that actually at that point in time, there is over harvest. You know, so the biggest thing is making sure that we have something in place. Reopen when we do this closure, and I believe 
you're not going to have 100 percent. You will have a over 90 percent resistance for the seafood issue. The seafood workers, the worst in this bay mindset. You know, they, there's a lot of talk. There's so many, there's so much talk going on right now. You know, every time I run, I run. There's, I can't hardly go to the store without running somebody going, hey, what well, way we done this? Why ain't we done this? Why have we done this? They, they don't know because they don't put the effort in to go and find out. But it's not going to be as big as the issue as you think when the closure comes about. Until these old handful of ulcers showed up, you know, just in the last month when the baby got closed down, before then, there was only two boats. Okay, that number kind of increased a little bit, you know. But there's some of these guys that's got regular jobs now that's going out there, you know, here and there just because they enjoy doing it. So the numbers, I mean, there's probably around 20 boats when the when cap one's open now. They're catching their limit. It's taking them a while. They're catching their limit. And and those also get protected and we start what well, we have our seed stock. But we are becoming fat limited. We're, we are... I see it. I'm out there all the time. I go look. But there's areas that's coming back that we see it. You know, so it's not a lost cause. And, and I know that we, we could have a productive harvest, commercial harvest in Okay. I want to say one thing just because I don't want people to get around that number. That 10 year number was Chesapeake Bay, and it was when they reached their really optimal level. It doesn't mean that there couldn't be, based on conditions, you know, limited entry much sooner. Don't well, forget, well, yeah, they didn't close it. Right there. So, you know, it was pretty still able to do it at some, some level. So, let's not let that 10 year statistic, that just shows you where the best performance is. Point was, not that there isn't points that could happen long before that, but it reason that it like what we described. So, I don't want that to make any of you think about it. Go ahead and finish it off real quick. The chest speaks on the open. Certain times of the year, anyway, correct? They're not open very long. Their harvest dates are not open that big window, are they? Well, it's a small, yeah, it's a relatively small window. That's, that's what, yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. They look around. Yeah, they look at the blue crabs and oysters. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they are closed quite a bit. Lee? Yeah, I, um, I know Ed's going to be working on a management plan. We're all be waiting with bated breath for it, but I think I think to close the bay, close the oyster harvest, and say we're going to come up with how we're going to reopen it down the road is going to cause a lot of problems. I think I think we should at least kind of compromise somewhere in the middle. Is that we're working on a new management plan for the bay. There's a lot of modeling that's going to go on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to come up with this new plan. But until we do, we should set out some parameters like we've talked about and say, reopening the bay <coughs> prior to this new management plan is going to involve a certain density of oysters, a certain percentage of bay with that density, potentially limited harvest. And, and the limited harvest could be, be like, some portion stuff, you know, Franklin County residents get a preference, people who have oyster licenses in the past get a preference, that kind of stuff. Um, and we can lay out some of these things that would be considered to reopen the base so that I think if we just say there's a group that's going to work on whatever the management plan is and come up with uh, how we're going to reopen the bay, I think we, we've got to get some information out there. You're going to have a lot of people going. Uh oh, here we go again, you know. We're being promised something, but they're not telling us anything about how we're going to get back to where we were. So it, it, I think we, we, we've got to provide some information of things that will be considered until we do have uh, a more detailed management plan. So it's yeah. sort of half and half. All right. I'm going to let Ed respond, and then I'm going to go back to the question, <coughs> which is Chad, Steve, and Neil. So, I uh, understand the concern of trying to, of wanting to have some assurance of under what conditions the wild oyster fishery in Upper Bay would be, you know, if that makes sense. But I do not have the information or the knowledge to tell you what those should be. And I would be especially concerned about listing one of them as a specific density per acre, unless that density per acre is the density at 
after this season. Because everything that we're talking about, whatever actions get taken, whether it is limited entry, whether it is a short season, whether it's specific areas, the goal is to make sure that there's enough oysters after the season ends so that there will be another season so that we don't find ourselves in the place again. And so I think we uh, can't tell you what would be a good density right now. And I don't think it's a good idea for us to put a number down about that, what that density should be. At least I don't think that we would have the science before the report closure to be able to back that up. I think what we could do is we could have, we could make more precise requirements about how the oyster management plan has to be approved that would determine what those conditions would be. And we can perhaps set an end date on when we want to have those conditions provided. But that's as much as I can say right now. Could you predict, based on your the science you have in modeling, what that additional end date might be when you prepare to make the actual learning simulations and come up with recommendations that would be based on the science model? If, if we want to have a stock assessment that the state would approve and we associate management plan, at bare minimum, we need a year to 18 months. The models that we could look at as a group can be done much faster than that. But those stock assessments and the management plan have to stand up to peer review scrutiny and potentially to uh, lawsuits should they be drawn. So that would take time. Um, and that requires, and that assumes that we have the data that we need to base those models on. And um, we have a lot of that data. I don't know if we have all of it right now. Okay, one more question. For the purpose of one of the simulations, understanding the sample and stock set for evaluating the options against our performance measure, when do you think that would be reasonable to expect? Not holding to it because I think we all know we're going to worry about more than that. Yeah, that's a different process than that. Happen a lot sooner as long as everyone here is willing to work with me on it, meaning that you know, I'm going to demand perfection. When we first show it to you, it's going to be true. The first models will be simpler. They won't have all of the bells and whistles. They'll probably be missing some aspects that some people in the front think are really important, and it will require people's feedback to be able to tell us what don't the models have, what do they have wrong. Um, and, and that's just to set up the different models. So that can be done within a couple of months. We can have a simple, a simple model showing. And most the population have a full day, and you can get to some of the data that we have. Really more detailed, spatially explicit models at least six to nine months. To be able to say, well, what would happen if we close this far but not that far? Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's exactly how we did it there. We did it through the process. We tested assumptions, data sets, uh, uncertainty in the group, and, and worked together privately with our stakeholders and our scientists to connect with the clients and models. What would be helpful for me and the other people who work on the model is if we at least have a starting list of the management strategies and actions and conditions that we want to evaluate it, because that will determine the structures that I have to build into the model to make sure we can evaluate it. Um, so it doesn't have to be a final list. We can always, I can always go back in and change it. But if I have some idea of what we're interested in the limited entry and we're maybe even interested in um, or user access rights to wild harvest specific sections of the bars. These are things that require different, the, the, the model being built a little, little bit differently. Uh, um, and I guess to add on to that, I would really recommend <coughs> that the conditions for reopening not, and I know the other people said this, not only be a density, but the conditions be the conditions for harvest as well. So that means whether it's a maximum amount of effort, a maximum amount of harvest, a certain amount of time, or more ideally, things like an end of season metric that, well, if the reef is below this certain physical level, or if there's this too many, too few oysters on the reef at the end of the season, then we're going to reduce it next season. So there has to be more than just a density at the beginning of the season to reopen it. Otherwise, I would expect that that be a very short lived history, and when it crashes up, would not expect we have the funding to restore it the way that we do this month. So, in this 
process, I think even today, we can discuss, and we already are sort of discussing the type of things that have to evaluate, not that they're not going to those key. So I think we can provide today a, a starter list of those things that we can start with. Uh, and I think we have a lot of it already. So that's fine. Okay, um, chat. All right, thank you. Um, I kind of try, try to find the middle ground there. I think. Um, I agree with both Ed and Lee in the last comments that we want to be lay out the parameters of what would take to open the bay, but we can't be specific. That's what we're working, that's what we're talking, we can't get ahead of that, that card there. Um, but we can lay out what are those conditions and what are those um, important parameters that we're going to be investigating. I think for going to the commission and getting, at least letting them know, I don't know to what extent they are aware this group is actually even existing and been meeting on a regular basis, but I think it would be important to them to know that there's this group that's working on it and working with scientists and trying to figure this out and come up with a, uh, a plan that can, they can come back to to figure out how we're going to reopen the bay if and when we do. And I think to answer the question for I think, um, come back to what Jim was describing earlier or asking earlier, do we have the justification and then what is the that game uh, best community support for closing the harvest of wild harvest of the I think we do with the numbers we saw today. I know it's not a you know quote unquote stock assessment of the bay for oysters, but the data is is pretty uh, staggering. And you know I come from the world of, of fish management and uh, fishery science and if we have a benchmark and the population assessment came back with indices well below that benchmark, and that's justification for immediate shutdown, immediate closure. So I think we even have today Justification for an emergency closure, so it might not even need to take one or two meetings and, and you know, deliberation <coughs> that the FWC could authorize its executive director to immediately shut the bay down based on the numbers you saw. And I don't know how new this information is, that's, you know, that a lot of that data has been um, going, going on. I think there's plenty of justification right now to do an emergency closure or just a, a closure. Thanks, Jack. Um, Steve? Um, I've been in the Commercial seafood business for about 30 something years. I love the industry. I love oysters. I like to eat oysters. And I love to see a healthy commercial oyster fishery. But um, over and above that, I'd like to see a healthy Mother Nature. I'd like to see a healthy bay. Um, in our group that we had talked about, our focus was going to be to restore the oyster reefs to the maximum amount we can restore them. It wasn't to make an oyster fishery. We have kind of all of a sudden sidetracked here. Now we're talking about commercial fishery and economics and, and maximizing uh, commercial oyster fishery. And I think we need to maybe reassess because I think our focus needs to be to um, restore a, a healthy oyster population in Apalachicola Bay. And if, if a healthy oyster fishery is a product of that, then that's great and we can do that. But if our focus is to make an oyster fishery, there's decisions and efforts that could be different than actually just trying to create a healthy bay and a healthy oyster population, a healthy oyster reefs in Appalachian Bay. I mean, we're talking about maybe to be closed, period. We don't need to come up with a theoretical uh, situation in the future. We don't know if oyster populations will ever come back in Appalachian Bay to support a commercial harvest. So why go through all the effort and time to try to come up with some theoretical scenario to reopen the bay that we may never even get to that point. We don't know that. So the bay needs to be closed immediately. It should have been closed long ago. It should be closed by the end of the day today with an emergency action because there's no oysters in the bay and we're, we're killing the bay. So the bay's bleeding that we're trying to figure out how we're going to, you know, instead of stopping the bleeding, we're just going to try to figure out if, you know, the bay can run a marathon again or something like this. We should our focus. We need to focus on a healthy bay and taking the oyster harvest oysters out of the bay. As <coughs> Sanders' presentation, the very first thing on the stressors was over harvesting. We're over harvesting the bay. We've been over harvesting the bay for years. And that was the first stressor that she listed that we could control. So the bay should be closed immediately without worrying about when we're going to reopen or how we're going to reopen. Certainly, we can talk about that. But um, and everybody, I don't know who disagree about reopening. If it, was, if it was in a situation that, that could support commercial harvest, that's my opinion. Okay. And, and remember, we have two main goals a healthy and productive ecosystem and sustainable management of fishery resources. So, those all things have to work together, and that's kind of the goal of the project. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I want to leave in Steve and Shannon and Shannon have already. 
Corey said this, I, I have to agree with them. We've talked about this since 2012, at the commission level, state level, the main bank management group, and it seems like one of the few steps we could take that's under control, and yeah, we may not ever know exactly, but here we are eight years later saying the exact same thing. So how can we move that forward so that we are taking steps, we're, we're doing something, and that to me is, something that can be done. I'm afraid if we wait till May and after May and it goes through the whole process, it's going to be you know, one more year, one more year. So I have to agree with what was said. Okay. So <clears throat> anybody that hasn't spoken yet would like a chance? Actually, any, anybody of our members who have not yet spoken? I'd like to recognize it. Anyway, uh, I would like to recommend with the reopening that it be treated as an adaptive management experiment explicitly and that you have a process for collecting monitoring data of the success of it, what's worked, and have the expectation that we're not going to get it perfect the first time. It's going to get changed as we learn, and that there's a link between learning and how we're doing it. And have that expected from the word go instead of later saying, oops, we didn't quite get it right. Now it's. Yeah, that's what it's. Okay, so the group is, has already said that they agree that wild harvesting and orchards should be closed as soon as possible. And we've talked about some of the potential parameters of what it might look like without specifics or reality. Certain density, certain acreage, varied locations, uh, limited entry, stage opening, shelling culture, replacing the shell. Uh, of course, whatever we do, part of our, one of all of our goals in this is adapting to one of the key objectives in these areas, and that certainly is on point. What other types of things uh, would you want to explore? And this would also help get ahead some information for the model. So, what other types of strategies? And I'm, Feel free to jump in. Uh, do you think that we should be thinking about both for restoring the health, but also <clears throat> ultimately by doing so creating some sort of uh, wild harvesting fishery uh, that's sustainable, both in terms of the resource, but also for uh, a certain amount of people making a living as a as a as a Jackson. One metric we didn't talk about, and I know I'm speaking from up the basin, is the price of the bushel oysters. Uh, there are a lot of folks out there that gave up on eating bagged oysters back at the $60 range, $70 range. Uh, and then the other thing I think we've mentioned it somewhere in here, but sanctuary stuff. You know, where can we set aside places that really are key to the health of the bag that we just don't need to be doing anything but moderating? Based on the and all that stuff. Yeah, good. Other thoughts? What other types of strategies, let's think broader than just the closure, what other types of strategies do we need to evaluate to, to, to both enhance the ecosystem and down the road be sustainable and manage correctly while hard time? Uh, I think Steve made a really good point. I mean, moving on from a decision to close the May to oyster harvest, right, requires that you learn something in the in the time period after that. And, um, I mean, it was interesting listening to people around the table that just assume that you know you, you could restore the day with some type of management action here, um, but there's clearly competing hypotheses. You know, perhaps multiple hypotheses out there as to why the oyster fishery decline. So, I think moving forward, you have to um, think about what action you're going to take to learn something as you put those oysters or whatever efforts um, you undertake. So, I just want to make sure that again, people learn something, right? Because it it may not come back, you know, the way that you expect it to, and so you. Know, 
have to understand what other knobs or levers you might have to turn or pull in order to maximize um, that oyster population that you're trying to ultimately manage. Absolutely, and I think that's the plan. We can build our science system, you know, habitat suitability and conditions. You want to speak to that with the summary? Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it seems important. So, yeah, we, we have a number of decision support tools that we're developing, and I'm really glad Chad brought up sanctuary reefs because that's one thing we are certainly considering. Um, but identifying areas that you know might be harvestable under different conditions would be part of the adaptive management process. You know, if we get a very wet year, for example, you know, are there areas that are more appropriate for harvest than others? Same if it's a very dry year, you know, maybe we need to slow things down a bit. So I'm not sure I'm really answering the question, but this is all feeding into all the science and decision support to us feeding into an adaptive management process. So, I did not answer the question, please re ask it. I don't think I did. <laughs> Basically, what you just described is absolutely how this point project is going on. And I just think people need to, to see that and understand, you know, um, exactly what those data are, are showing you, right? And can you make decisions? Can they, can they trust or have some confidence in those data? And as we go through the process with our model, if we're running simulations, showing the data, showing the assumptions, the uncertainty, discussing the actions and agreement on whether they should be tweaked based on global world observations, and then over time that builds confidence that what your the simulation results are the things that you trust. That's kind of what we do there. Kind of it's, it's called collaborative modeling. And it's important that the, the scientists working with stakeholders can embrace you know, those, uh, those perspectives and, and get the results that matter. So they found that out and they did that big Chesapeake uh, model. People didn't trust the result. They tell Chesapeake better. So they, that's one of the lessons they learned there. Um, wait. Yeah, I, I have a question. I don't know if Orsha or Kerry can answer it, but um, in the past we've talked about you know shifting oyster bars in the different seasons and this and that kind of stuff, but but there are certain rules that the, the feds have related to the amount of data you have for so many years. Uh, is that potentially, if, if you wanted to say, okay, we want to we want to have a, an area of like dry bar to come back, and we want to open it at different times than we did in the past, do the rules and regulations related to public health and that type of thing? Will those impact being able to do that? Because my understanding on some of this was you have to have at least five or ten years worth of data before you can make some of these changes. So, I'm saying yes, that would impact <laughs> the ability to make decisions on we had a wet year or a dry year, so we're going to open this one and keep this one closed. So, the public health concerns for the, for, I forget the name of the agency, the FDA report. FDA, ISSC. Yeah. The IOC, yeah. Um, so that affects the ability of some of the management that we can do. That's what I thought it's going to be. 30 samples, essentially three years, but we're, we've been doing that a little bit more as well, sampling in, in different seasons, different wetness products. So we're collecting more data, but it's just going to take time. So it's this group would start proposing locations based on best available science. We are, yes. All right. Um, other thoughts? Going out of the box, thoughts? All right. Well, I'm not sure yet. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll refer to so, that. So I hope somewhere the ACF stakeholders Bay assessment has made it into this process. I know it made it to Felicia. And Steve might help us on this, but there were scenarios run through that process. Harris Georgia Caucus, who was the model for our process, uh, proposed various spring and early summer pulses at various rates of 12,000 cubic feet per second and all the way up to 16 to 18,000. It's two separate pulses for two weeks. 
trying to change the salinities in his hydrodynamic model. He can jump in when I get off course. Uh, but Eris also, in addition to that, actually he ran scenarios until they started to drain Lake Lanier. And naturally that got folks up there. He's at Georgia Tech, so that, you know, I think he got some political pressure from the Georgia folks to go run too many scenarios on that end. Uh, but Eris also came down here, and as he looked around, he'd never eaten oysters until he came down here with one of the ACF meetings. And he's doing this all over the world like I guess some of our models are doing. He sent Dan Tom Tomsmeyer through the roof when he suggested, well, maybe you need to start thinking about engineering the bay. What can you do? Uh, if you can't control the freshwater flows for whatever reasons, can you limit the saltwater flows? And so Harris was thinking about uh, Sykes Cut, which is a big, huge issue. I'm not making anything about that. Uh, there's a bunch about Lake Wilmico. Where's all this fresh water going? Uh, so I would say that's uh, on the outside, you know, or where are you culture? I've kind of been kidding people that you're culture in the wrong direction. You're climate change is going to be I don't know what that means. I'm just... But then the other thing is this flow issue is you know, what can we do to get the three states to work together outside of the courts? And there is a proposal in the Sustainable Water Management Plan that we did about the Transboundary Water Management Institution. And uh, it just seems to me if we're not able to somehow adjust to whatever the future flow regime is going to be, uh, then what our answers are to this problem may not exist, or it's certainly the control us. So I think this process needs to uh, take those issues into account. And, and I think the work Eris did, he, he was one modeler that did a hydrodynamic model and a flow model. Steve. So I will because Steve's part Steve of the team. Right. So I was going to make a quick comment regarding that. I think that if we're going to look at pulses in the river, then it shouldn't just be done based on what the capacity of the reservoirs are to make a pulse, but it really should relate back to the work that Ed's doing of when and how much water do you need to make a difference in terms of your ecology, and then what is the capacity to develop the water management system to do that? And that was not done for your support. So, therefore, I, you know, I think it would be an interesting question, but we need to go further down the road, have that information, and we can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Chuck. Well, I grew up here as a kid. You could not oyster in the summertime. Period. And I don't remember just when that changed or why it changed. I assume it's based on economics. But I, I can remember when the horsemen they used to go get summer jobs. And it was tough on some people, but that was something they were doing even back then to keep the over harvesting. But I think the whole thing here that we're going to end up coming to is there will never be you know, <coughs> oyster anymore. We're going to limit certain places. You know, I kind of look at what happened in the scalping over in St. Joe Bay, which is purely recreation. But look what's happened to that in the last 20 years. I mean, they had red tide issues. But I remember going over there with my friend, and we'd come back with four or five gallon buckets. Scotland. It was legal. And, and our thinking then was, well, we're going to go get all we can get so we can eat scallops all year long. See, so we got to eat for the rest of the year. It wasn't so much that we were going for fun. It was fun, but we were going to blow up. And you know, I know we're talking about the recreational part on, on oysters. I can remember as a kid, we'd go to dry bar and sometime we'd go out to just pick them up by hand, you know, all you wanted, and bring them home. And I mean, that was nice, but I, I don't, I don't know what effect the recreational horse you really had. So I kind of think we might need to look at that as far as maybe allow some folks to do a recreational when when it gets back to some sustainable level. <laughs> 
it is an important part of our cultural community going to the next set of things. So, uh, Chad and Steve. I think once we get into the, uh, the metrics of, of what would be conditions right for harvesting, a lot of harvesting, I think we're going to have to marry that with uh, uh, conservative fishing mortality. <coughs> you know, not not necessarily. So that could, that would dictate. And now from from that we would see how many you know could be how many people would be able to be in the field for a entry. So the time, the, the resource, the abundance, and the densities to fishing effort that would allow, we'll say, 15 or 30 percent uh, mortality on those reefs, um, fishing mortality, or whatever the metric we would come up with. And then from there, based on that resource, uh, how many, you know, how many bags, and therefore how many people would be able to harvest that season. But that's, I know we're, that's getting ahead of the game, but I think we'll have to, when we're doing the modeling, those are the kind of things we need to look at, I think, is, is time, what fishing mortality levels would be uh, sustainable and acceptable. Also, part of the modeling, um, I think it'd be interesting to look at how much areas, footprint wise, based on density um, scenarios um, and proximities, how much sanctuary or spawning trees uh, would be needed to, to sustain some of those harvest or some type of harvest. So, tying and looking at scenarios of, of looking at the sanctuary trees versus the harvestable trees and, and, and how those ratios and proportionalities. Um, with all the assumptions that have to go into that, uh, how much areas of restoration or sanctuary areas would be needed to, to, to maintain a productive uh, fishery? Those are the kind of things I'm thinking about from having the model. Yeah, Steve? Um, your question a few minutes ago was what other actions we propose, what other steps besides closing the bank? Uh, the first one that came to the right in the mind was to rebuild oyster reefs. And um, how do we build those reefs? Uh, traditionally, we've taken their various materials from fossilized shell or natural shell and live rock and various stuff that we put down. There's, we need to investigate more. There's some man made stuff, some matting and webbing. There's different types of you know, ideas out there to, that we can use and possibly, I don't know if any of them are, are realistic or successful or not, but we need to rebuild oyster reefs. Um, and also increase increase the monitoring and data collection and you know real time um, real time adaptive management. So, 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 yeah. Steve, to that point, one of the objectives of our project is to try different things like that. You said there are traditional ways of doing things. And Different people have tried different things in different places, so one of the objectives of our work is to do different experiments, you know, to just try and see what see what works and what doesn't in this particular instance, so uh, it's it's on the list of things to do. So it's, it's, bad, it's bad on shell too. Yeah, that's, yeah one of, it's bad on shell. that's one of the reasons we built the hatchery, so uh, at the time it was uh, kind of, wasn't really supported. Uh, because it, you know, Florida wasn't spat limited, and we still don't technically know if it is, but it's looking like it is. And so, you know, spat on culture is one of the, you know, it's kickstarted, let's see it. Um, it's one of the uh, approaches that we're going to try. Yeah, they're doing that up in the children, too. Okay, well, it's it's noon. I think we uh, contemplated that. Okay, folks, let's take a 30-minute break and come back.